Welcome, and um, just I was going to say thank you very much to John yeah, um, for letting us letting us be here and uh, to do this sort of the first of hopefully many plant life um, uh, wildflower identification training sessions as part of our project, which is rare plants and wild connections. Um, I'm going to introduce Ben and Alison Averis, um, who are um, gurus in training. <laughs> I always like to think of as Ben as a guru. I could just sit at his feet and listen to him explain about plants any day of the week. Um, so Ben's going to be our trainer today, um, and he's going to take us through what plants you can find in grasslands. Um, we're lucky enough here to have several different types of grassland species and grassland types. So he's going to cover the different types of grasses that you might come across and some of the, some of the identification things for some of those species. Um, if you've got a notebook and pencil or pen, I would suggest you write things down because I've found that I refer back to those notes time and again when I'm back out on a, uh, doing a survey. So um, it's really useful. Um, so there's a discussion that was um, around the, the real concern about the, the reduction in species-rich grassland in the Cairngorm National Park. Well, nationally across Scotland, but particularly in the National Park. Um, so there was a, a sort of discussion that was had a few months ago um, between Plant Life and uh, representatives from Nature Scott and NFFN and various other groups. And we were thinking, how can we support farmers to try and work towards increasing plant species diversity and number on farms without asking them to plough up their fields, reseed, spend huge amounts of money, disrupt soil carbon and soil health? What, you know, how can we get them to continue to be productive farmers, but at the same time increase that species diversity? Um, and I, as well as working for PFLA and doing some work for the NFFN farm, um, and also Clem, who you'll be meeting later, has been facilitating a mob grazing uh, group initially through the Soil Association, but now um, we're an independent mob grazing um, Scotland group. And all of us within the mob grazing group who've been implementing mob grazing, which is essentially um, intensive grazing in small paddocks, animals being moved very frequently with long rest periods, have all noticed massive increases in our uh, plant species diversity. So we thought it would be worth giving it a go to have um, farmers testing out mob grazing so that they're still getting productivity, they're not having to reduce the number of animals they've got, they're still able to have the same productive outputs, but building rest into their grazing system means that there's a more potential for plants to express themselves, for flowering plants to have that opportunity to come through. So that was the kind of, we thought that that might be an idea, and let's try it and um, get five farmers on board to test this out. So this project is about planning for that and getting all of the, um, the knowledge and the skills and the equipment ready so that next year our farmers are able to actually implement it and hopefully we'll be able to secure some more funding to do that. Um, but what's really exciting is that we recognise that there's a bit of a, a knowledge gap in being able to identify these species and that's where you guys are going to come in to give the training but also pairing farmers up with volunteers who can work a little bit more collaboratively getting out onto farms, working with farmers to help do some of that um, baseline surveying. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, really exciting and this is the first project of its kind in any national park in the UK. So this is really, really exciting. Nobody else in any other national park is doing this. The, there, there are kind of two elements, as I see it, to what there is to um, communicate today. One is to do with species and the other one to do with uh, plant communities. Because those of you working on this project where you're recording information in the grasslands, um, from a monitoring point of view in that you'd be going back to the same places over forthcoming years and, um, and doing more kind of quadrat based recording. But um, you'll be recording species in these quadrats but uh, the choice of exactly which species will depend on what the assessment is overall of that grassland type because the different grassland types have got different sets of species to record in them. Um, and the different types, there's four, isn't it? So acid, neutral, calcareous, and the sort of wet one, which is actually quite vague as well. So one of the main things to try to uh, put across 
is how to identify which of those four types you're in. Uh, so yeah, these are relatively broad types, acid, neutral, calcareous, and, um, and the wetter ones. The first three, the acid, neutral, and calcareous, are the, uh, on the driest, and they may all look much of a muchness at first glance. And so it's uh, it's handy. They, they also can share a lot of species. Uh, they're, they're not all completely different species. So um, one of the one of the fundamental things to have in mind is um, that that sort of little group of species that can be telling, particularly telling as to which kind we're in. Um, from that point of view we can keep a short list of sort of um, really telling species in our mind. For example, wild thyme, calcareous grass. That's the sort of most um, significant species for identifying the grass in calcareous wild thyme. Uh, heath bed straw for acid. Really, really common plant in acid grass. It's more common there than, 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 than the other plants. Um, these are things to be sort of looking out for a lot. Neutral grasslands, red clover, bulbous buttercup, um, oxeye daisy, knapweed. And the wet grassland, by the way, is a bit of a broader, rather varied group of plant communities uh, with things like rushes. Some examples have a lot of rushes in them, the big taller rushes. Soft brush, um, sharp flower brush, and so on. Um, and it can also, in another form, it can be um, more grassy with a hell of a lot of uh, purple mulberries. We might see some of that. Heath bed straw, good acid grass in the species. Here's some here. And uh, first, how to identify it? It's got white flowers. Yeah, it's got white flowers and um, it's got leaves. Of course the flowers have gone over now, but when they were there they would have been very tiny and white. Very tiny but lots of them in little clusters. So you can you can see them from a bit of a distance actually when you're standing when they're right out in flower in a real acid grassland with a lot of the species, you've just got some white frothy stuff or a little scatter of white stuff. Among the yellow flowers of the tormento, absolute classic acid grassland scene is um, is grassland dotted with white and yellow. White of heath bed straw, yellow of tormento. Um, and um, the uh, corresponding scene in calcareous grassland is uh, yellow with tormento. You can get some of that there as well, but pink of the thyme instead of the white of the bed straw. But you can get both species together in intermediates here and there as well. But that in which case, the balance between the two will help to decide you know, if you've got more of the thyme or more of the bed straw. Um, so, the, um, as with all bed straws, the leaves are pretty small and they grow in whorls, in groups all coming from the same part of the stem. And you can get up to about eight in the um, heath bed straw. And the flowers, tiny petals, aren't they? Very, very small. And the four um, off, is it four? The, I think there are four in a petal, but there are four petals in a in a flower, yeah. yeah. Um, across the other bed straws as well. So the, the flowers are just the same really as the flowers of some other bed straws, like the marsh bed straw, the fen bed straw, the limestone bed straw. The way to tell them is the the leaves and the stems. They've all got little leaves like this. Heath bed straw feels very smooth because there are no hairs on the stems, and there are hairs on the edges of the leaves, but they're quite thin and they point forwards. So if you kind of feel the, the leaf, there's no roughness to it, the whole thing, there's no, no roughness. Um, in contrast, marsh bed straw and fen bed straw have, have backward pointing um, little hairs on the stems and the leaves, so it gives the whole thing a rough texture. And limestone bed straw, which is not very common, looks just like this, but it's got backward pointing hairs on the edges of the leaves. So. Um, it's, uh, you can think of heath bed straw as smooth. It's um, very, very common in, um, in acid grasslands. So here, 
this would suggest that we're looking at some acid grasslands, at least in the immediate sense. But it's on a little raised knoll, which is going to be effectively a bit more acid, a bit more leached with nutrients and so on. So um, it's quite possible that you could have a little, little raised knoll here of acid grassland amongst something surrounding it that's not so acid, that's maybe, maybe more neutral. Mat grass is one of those small minority of grass species that have really thin wiry leaves. Here it's some here. Um, and it grows in a dense tuft. Here's some of those thin leaves. See how thin they are? Just like kind of wire. And um, there's a leaf. Now, on its own, that, <coughs> that leaf could equally be um, a leaf of um, some other common grasses, like um, wavy hair grass, or red fescue, or even sheep's fescue, but it's a little bit on the long side of sheep's fescue. Um, but mat grass leaves come in a dense tuft, really dense tuft. Um, it's, a very, it's a very tough, textured plant is mat grass, so much so that to pull a bit out is quite a hard job. <laughs> I was with somebody once and she got out a knife and did it. That shows how there anyway. And that shows how strong somebody can be if they pull it out without a knife. <laughs> no, I'm not claiming any More kind impressed. of strength like that. <laughs> um, it's not that hard. Anyway, you see see these um, these bits of, of mat grass here, um, the leaves, the vis more visible parts of the leaf, which are actually only parts of the leaf, because um, with any kind of grass, one can remember, I'll pull a bit out on its own here. Um, if, you, if you take a grass like that and you say to somebody, um, what have we got here? They might say, oh, well, you've got a stalk, it's like a stem and then you've got leaves coming out there. Actually, grass leaves are a bit more complicated than that. The sticking out bit is only part of the leaf, that's what we call the blade. And then there's a long bit down there that's wrapped closely around the stem, as if it's trying to hide itself in a bit. That's actually still part of the leaf. And that's the sheath. So the sheath and the blade. And um, in a lot of grasses, actually in most grasses, at the junction of the sheath and the blade, there's also a tiny little sticking up flap. It's so tall, so tiny on there, you can't really see it. But, but that flap, for future reference, is called the ligule. And some, in some species, that helps for identification. Anyway, the sticking out bit is the blade. And the characteristic feature of mat grass is that where the blade leaves the sheathing bit, it sticks out at a really wide angle, really sudden angle. The other wiry leaf grasses just um, have the blade going up there, like, like most other grasses. So this is like purposefully sticking out. You know, that one there is actually going backwards. It's going slightly down. It's like um, somebody's made them to, to have these, these really strong angles. And actually, there's a, at the bottom of the blade and top of the sheath, it's like everything's slightly widened and made sort of you know, like people make brackets that you get to in, in the DIY shop, and it's, it's, it's as if they're sort of reinforced at the corners to make sure that there's that strong angle. So that's a feature of mat grass, and then holding the whole thing up there, you can see um, a lot of those blades sticking out very, very widely. And that will identify it, even without the flowering heads. So you don't, you don't, all you need is the leaves of mat grass, and you can identify it. Here, this is another. Um, important species to know when we're looking at grasslands is tormentor. Oh, yes. And um, see these little, in flower, stands out, see these little yellow flowers? Yep. Same kind of yellow as buttercup, but they're smaller, whole plants lower grown. And the flowers have just got four petals, whereas buttercup's got some five. And um, it's easy to tell that way. Occasionally you might find a tormentil flower with five petals, but not very often. And if you see an awful lot of tormentil, it kind of suggests it might well be acid, but it's not such a good indicator for acid grasslands as would be the heath bed straw, which is that little bit more strongly associated to, strongly, um, I wouldn't say confined to it, but um, uh, an indicator of acid grassland. And also the mat grass 
and when we see it, hopefully, the wavy hair grass, those are the stronger indicators of acid grassland. But yeah, if you see a real lot of tormento, the really abundance, it's more likely to be an acid grassland. Um, if you haven't got the flowers of tormento, the leaves will um, help to tell it as well because they're, um, they have, each leaf has three leaflets and they are a sort of narrow oval more or less but they've got quite jaggy teeth in, um, towards their tips from the middle through to the tip and they're a slightly darkish green I would say they're slightly darkish, some might say they're pale but you know they're, they're dark. and um, at the base of the leaf, these leaves are coming out straight from the stem and at their bases you can see what look like two more little leaflets. They're actually stipules. Stipules are little leaf or leaflet-like things that grow on the stems of some plant species. And um, so it looks like there are five leaflets there. The um, lower leaves of Tormentil have stalks. So there, there it's more obvious that they're just three, three leaflets. So basically it's three, leaf three leaflets and they've got like quite jaggy teeth, not very many teeth, but they're quite big and jaggy teeth. Acid grasslands is uh, sheep's sorrel. Mm. Sheep, yeah. Um, you know the two sorrels, common sorrel and sheep, sheep's sorrel, with flowers like dockums, um, but leaves a lot smaller, kind of oval to oblong leaves, with lobes at the base that either point directly downwards if it's common sorrel, or stick out sideways in the case of the sheep sorrel, quite a bizarre shaped leaf really. So um, this is it here, a really easy plant to recognise, found mainly on thin dry acid soils. This sward down here below that hummock um, is looking rather more like neutral grass then. There's not much change really in the grass species, a lot of overlap as you'd expect anyway. Uh, but the red clover, easy thing to tell by the way, these a bit more pink than red really, heads of flowers, and leaves with um, leaflets that are a bit longer and slightly more pointed usually than those of the white clover. A little bit darker with these pale blobs. You get the pale blobs in the white clover as well, but white clover's leaves are really rounded, and really, really blunt at the tips. These ones, especially the leaves up the stems, get more narrow. There's some great to hold up beside it. Oh, the white clover to compare. Yeah, there's there's a white clover leaf against the the red um, the, the stem the leaves of the stem of the red clover. It's a very um, very rounded leaf. It's a white clover. So whilst white clover tends to suggest, the more of it there is, it suggests that um, there's high nutrient status and maybe there's been some agricultural treatments in the past. Red clover is actually more common in the um, grasslands that have not been agriculturally um, treated, more unimproved grasslands. So that's a neutral, suggesting neutral. There's also ribwort plantain, which is um, particularly common in neutral grasslands, though it can also be in calcareous and some of the even some of the acid. Easy one to tell. Not any flower heads here, but the leaves are. Mm, they said, look. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> For the camera, um, quite a some might say a boring looking flower head. It's quite a tough textured stem with this little head. They got they got pale coloured stamens earlier in the year when they're out. But um, yeah, like a funny kind of catkin if you think, not, not, uh, not a bright pretty flower. But the leaves are always distinct, they're narrow oval with the veins all running parallel. In that respect, plantains look more like orchids, as far as the leaves are concerned. Um, orchids and lilies and things, but they're hairy, the orchids and lilies are not hairy. So if there's a lot of ribwort plantain with this, with this narrow oval leaf, 
that also suggests neutral. There's a lot of that. This one, that's an easy one to tell when it's got the flowering heads on. These have gone over now. They come out quite early, um, more of a spring, early summer plant. Uh, it's not, it's not branched, as in like that. That bent grass there has got lots of little branches within the head, within the flowering head. But this one, it's a simple head, uh, flowering head. And it's sweet the vernal. Sweet vernal grass. Yep. So it's a, a bunch of these little spikelets. They come quite shiny and green at first. And then they die off to this pale buff golden colour and they remain quite you know, well into the autumn, which helps for identification. The leaves, they're not thin and wiry like the mat grass, they've got some breadth to them. And in that sense, they look like leaves of so many other kinds of grasses. Um, how to tell it? Well, if you look at um, the base of the leaf blade, which is the top of the sheath, you know, um, then as well as having a little sticking up flap called a ligule, which so many grasses have, you've also got um, some very well, kind of ring of hairs that are long enough to be quite distinct, even visible with the naked eye. And another thing about the, the leaf of the sweet vernal grass, at least in the spring when they're um, fresher, if you, if you eat it, it tastes of almonds. The roots. Less lemony. Yeah. No, a bit there. The roots can have <coughs> an unexpectedly strong medicinal kind of smell to them. Um, they vary a bit. Sometimes it's quite mild, but um, sometimes you get one, and it's a really strong kind of coarse. I think for me, it's really the, the really strongest smelling sweet kernel <coughs> grass roots. Flowering head is the most distinctive thing, the easiest way to pick it out. Again, it's not branched, it's just a, a stem with these little spikelets arranged you know, um, left and right. Very neat actually. Um, each spikelet there has multiple flowers in it. And um, the whole spikelet, because they're arranged left and right, the whole head, so the whole flowering head is rather flattened from side to side, so if you've got the camera on it there, there's some width to it, but as I turn it round at right angles, it goes much thinner. Um, in that way you can tell it from a superficially similar looking grass, it's pretty common, is cooch grass, Eutrigia repens, which is actually a much bigger and more leafy looking thing. But it has the flower heads kind of a bit similar, but as if each one of those spi individual spikelets has been turned around at right angles so that the whole head um, has a reasonable amount of thickness, whichever way you turn it. And what does um, that tell you about the soil when you've got that? It does best on neutral soils, especially where there's a reasonable nitrogen content, so it's quite fertile, nutrient rich soil. And uh, it's a species that gets uh, reseeded, you know, it goes into reseeding um, seed mixtures. Um, so you can get whole fields that have um, been ploughed and reseeded with uh, rye grass. Without the flower head, you can still tell it if you've got a decent amount of leaf material because the undersides of the leaves are very shiny and the base of the leaf blade kind of clasps the stem. This leaf here isn't a very, uh, very impressive one. If you get the whole field of rye grass on a sunny day, you can actually see that see sort that of shed. glistening look of the air, the sun catching the undersides of the leaves are really shiny. And the leaf base is sort of like it has little oracles that stick out and clasping around the stem. And the upper surface of the leaf, when you look at it close, you see it's got lots of um, grooves and ridges running parallel on the upper surface. Uh, but it's distinct in other ways. It's got a square sectioned stem, which is quite stiff, and leaves in opposite pairs, and each leaf um, is wider, really below the halfway point, and then tapers gradually to a slightly blunt tip. It's quite a distinctive shape really. 
leaves are this. And further up the stem, the stalk gets shorter. The leaf stalk gets stalk. It's short, shorter. Nice little plants. Uh, neutral grassland is uh, what it likes. Is to that an one? It is the actually on the. I'm pretty sure. I'll just check. Um, but um, neutral grassland. Um, South Hill is on the list. What it is, it's a little low grown, it's a dwarf shrub actually because its stems are actually woody even though they're so thin. Sort of browny purpley colour to the stems. The leaves are in opposite pairs and they've got a few hairs on their edges very commonly. Little, little leaves, kind of oblong oval shape and um, look at that scent to them as well. You can smell it here, can't you? And uh, it creeps around, low grown, like this is typical growth of it. It's a moonlight. It's a right. Um, and in flower, there's a flowering um, head of it here, mm -hmm. with its pink flowers white out. So one of the typical features of uh, calcareous grassland, given that Scottish calcareous grasslands are mostly pretty well grazed and short, is that you'll see among a short grassy sward a lot of the pink of the, um, the wild thyme. That's the classic calcareous grassland um, sort of appearance. It's, it, you get this in acid neutral and calcareous grasslands, but most commonly neutral and calcareous. Like the heath beds draw, it's got whirls of leaves, but um, the leaves are really, really narrow. They look a bit like leaves of bell heather, so the parallel side is narrow. And quite a, quite a lot in a world you can get between uh, you can get up to about a dozen leaves in the world. In flower like this, it's quite unmistakable because you have a, it's a bigger, more upright thing than the um, the, uh, the heath bed straw, and you can get a quite a long uh, flowering head with lots of clusters of yellow flowers. So, you say neutral um, calcareous. Neutral to calcareous, that's yes. where, it's, where it's most common. Okay. But we can get it um, in some of the richer acid grasses as well, so that alone isn't going to place us. Okay. So it's, it's about the balance of different species. In any bit of grassland we can get some a mix of some species that are more common in neutral, some that are more common in acid, some that are more common in calcareous, but it's the overall balance. Is the thing to um, uh, to look for to assess. Oh, the devil's bit scabious, by the way. Yeah, the flowers are very distinct, whether you call them bluish or purplish or whatever. You know what I mean. <laughs> then they're in these dense, round heads. Um, the leaves, <coughs> the leaves in the individual leaves are a fairly ordinary kind of shape. Let's get a one here. Here we are. Um, a kind of fairly narrow oval and um, in that way they look a bit like the leaves of some other species, especially knapweed, um, which is another thing that's on these lists uh, for neutral grasslands. Really. And, um, and so you can get this and knapweed together in some neutral grasslands. And um, how to tell, you know, if you see them, especially if it's uh, not yet flowering, how to tell devil's bit scabious from knapweed. The, um, when you've got the stems coming up, the flowering stems um, growing up there and you see the leaves growing on them, devil's bit scabious leaves are in opposite pairs up those stems, knapweed's leaves not. They're just one here, one there, in different positions. Uh, if you've just got the basal leaves, you can still tell it because when you look at the underside there's, I don't know if the camera can pick that up there, um, can that focus on it there? Yeah. You see the, um, the underside, which is of course, as in most leaves, it's paler than the upper side. You see all those, that pattern of like a network of little veins and side veins and all their divisions. They're, they're all darker than the pale background and they are very, very fine. It's, um, it's a bit like someone's had a, a very a very fine pen and drawn them on there very very carefully um, all on that otherwise kind of quite flat surface 
knapweed, the undersurface of the knapweed leaf has a pattern of veins on it, but they're quite a bit coarser. Hopefully we'll see knapweed later on, it's a pretty common plant. Um, with the knapweed, you don't get so much detail, so many intricate little divisions there. And the veins that we do find in the knapweed on the underside of the leaf, um, they are in some kind of relief. It's like they've been punched through, so they stick out a little bit. And that's, that's one of the ways that you get to notice them. So you get a bit of a shadow, light and shadow effect. Um, whereas on this, it's like they've been properly drawn there. Someone's got that very fine pen and very carefully put them on a smooth surface, a much neater job. So, you, so they are distinct, those two species. Napweed's whole leaf, both the upper side and the underside, is more coarse textured, more kind of coarsely hairy. So yeah, devil's bit scabious leaf, it's been, like it's been made very well. I always imagine plants made in factories for the purpose of teaching. I often describe them in those terms, but I do know that they weren't made in factories. Don't get me wrong there. <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you that they were, but sometimes behaving talking as if they were can help bring out some of the, um, the differences. Um, so this is a very nicely sort of made little leaf here. Um, a really distinctive thing about Coxfoot is that the base, that the bottom of the leafy shoot here is kind of flattened. It's like someone's come along and squashed it. Right. I don't know if any, any, anybody would want to do that, but um, if they have, they've been doing it a heck of a lot because it's <laughs> everywhere you look at <laughs> and find Coxford looking at the bottom, that's happened. And so, you, so, so if you've got the camera on it, it looks, actually it's a very tidy looking, amazing lush looking thing. It looks like a sort of leap a little bit in that kind of view mm -hmm. with a lot of width to it. And as you turn it right angles, much narrower. Yeah. Like it's been flattened and squashed sideways. Beautiful grass. In, in that sense, with the flattened shoot, it resembles another grass, but you won't confuse it because the scale is very different. It's annual meadow grass, power annual, which is that titchy little thing that grows in amongst paving slabs and things like that on the edges of paths. Very, very small grass, you're never mistaken. So, flattened shoots, and, and, the, and the, the sheathing part of the leaf that's come away from the stem there is, uh, is because the whole thing's flattened, it's it's really keeled along its edge there. You'd have to sort of physically get the thing and open it out here. See, it's just not wanting to, to flatten out here, to open out that sheathing part. You might uh, see after, uh, sorry I shouldn't say Helen, you might see after grazing, um, it's the, the c cattle particularly, if, if there's, depending on the time of the year, will really eat down into the roots and you'll see these kind of, where at the bottom, I don't know Ben if you've still got that bit that you pulled out, but mm. it's quite pale. Yeah. So, you know, all the leaf will be gone and there'll just be this kind of pale, sort of fleshy bit at the bottom that's just clumps of those sticking up, mm. which is quite interesting to see. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily, you don't see it with other plants, I guess. Mm. I think the other thing about Coxfoot that um, always astounds me is when you see seeded varieties, so where it's been put in as a, a reseed or something and it's not naturally occurring, it's not tufted. Mm. And so, yeah, get very used in, in uh, permanent pasture seeing these lovely tufts with the seed uh, heads coming off them, but you'll just see like a seed head and one other, one other leaf kind of yeah. section coming off yeah. it and it just kind of looks a bit sad. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's so different between the kind of naturally occurring, I guess, the native occurring version and that that's been seeded. Yeah. So it's, it's commonest in neutral grasslands, that one, um, but can grow here and there and other, other kinds. It's really common. Of the, um, in the wet habitat, it's marsh bed straw. It's not in flower. That's why everything's Where is dull it and green. That. Oh. See the, the heath bed straw that we had, which has leaves yes. in whorls. This is a bit more tall and scrambling up through other plants. The leaves are fewer in number to a whorl. There's only four there. Some of them you'll get five or even up to six. White flowers and, um, again? It has white flowers. Flowers are all the same. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's, um, you can tell that that's not heath bed straw, not just because it looks a bit taller and more scrambling, but it's rougher to the touch. It's got little, very tiny, short, but backward pointing prickly hairs along it. 
so it gives it a rougher texture. Ah. Um, and you can see those, those hairs under the hand hairs as well on the edge of the rug. There's uh, one of the very commonest, possibly about the commonest rush species, tall rush species that you find in these grasslands in Scotland is the soft rush, which hopefully it's not good down the stitch. Tufted sort of rush. Fox rush. Soft, uh, soft, soft rush. Soft rush. Drunkocephusus. Um, you can see the, the big rushes that you get, um, you can divide them into two groups. What, what, what I call sideways flowering rushes. You see the way the flowering head comes out on the side, quite a bit below the top. And then the top flowering rushes where it's more at or almost at the very top and is sort of a big, more widely branched head pointing upwards. This is a sideways flowering one, dense tuft and um, with a moderately dense little head of mid-brown mid -brown colour and a smooth stem. The stems actually, if you look very, very close, it's got tiny grooves in it, but they're so shallow that it feels smooth in contrast to another rush called um, Compact Rush, which has a darker, much more compact head and a more ridged and rough feeling stem. So um, they're easy things to tell apart and for this purpose with their recording form, it does ask you um, to estimate the amount of rush cover that, but excluding this species, so other, other big rushes like the compact rush or the sharp flowered rush, which is about the next commonest one, uh, would count. The reason why this one, they say, for the purpose of recording the amount of cover in a quadrat, not to include this one, is because soft rush can grow not just in places that are more naturally damp and nice kind of wetland environments, but also it can get into places that have been a bit more disturbed, like roadside banks and things, and fell kind of plantations. Sneezeworths, it likes damp to wet neutral soils, and it's got these uh, little heads of a bit like yarrow, kind of, yeah. um, white flowers. It's in the same genus as yarrow, oh. but the leaves, you know how yarrow leaves are all divided up into lots of fine segments, but they're not here, they're just mm -hmm. um, narrow, linear kind of um, leaves, except that to make it more exciting, they've got really fine teeth, loads of them when you look close. Um, really, if I, if I actually get a leaf and you can get the camera on it. Um, it in the right sort of angle. There are, uh, as, as, as teeth go on the edges of a, um, of a leaf, you can't really do better than this. The leaves, if anything, there's more leaves down there. They look most similar, all common species, to the leaves of ground elder, um, Agopodium. <clears throat> but ground elder, it's a non-native plant of mainly disturbed habitats, not quite so wet as this. My garden. And um, yeah, and it's <laughs> ground elder leaves aren't generally divided up into as many segments, as many leaflets as these angelica leaves get divided into. And another thing is that ground elder leaves are all green, whereas in angelica you get this um, dark spot there at the junctions of the, uh, the bases of the oh, leaflet yes. stalks or the bases of the main, oh, yeah. the main junctions within the mm -hmm. whole leaf. So hairless, purplish tinge to the stem, very common, and especially those purple blotches at the junctions within the leaf will always separate it from ground elder whose leaf is, tends to be smaller. Like that, the ground elder leaf might be the whole of just this, but this is actually just part of this angelic leaf because also that and that. I'm not going to pull it out too much because I'll get stung by those nettles if I do that as they come green through the there. But you can see it's a big, a big leaf. The lower leaves of angelic can be really big. Oh, I've seen them. Is this, this big single leaf? Mm. Including the leaf stalk, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, distinctive plant. Because it grows so tall, it helps us to um, pick out some of these, uh, not just wetland habitats compared to dry, but also if we're looking at the rooms within wetland region, it helps to separate um, some of the more neutral ones from some of the more acid ones where it's going to grow. Purple moorgrass. Purple moorgrass. See how that, that leaf, well, it would get a bit wider still, except it's been a bit more. But, but even at that distance, you can see it narrowing. Yes, I do. 
and there's, that's the sheathing part from there down. And if you look sideways, no ligule, no sticking up flap, but there's, there's hairs. Mm. And interesting, um, nothing else yeah. around seems to have been grazed, but that does. It's funny that, because mm. in some places purple moorgrass thrives really well um, where there is grazing and seems not to be touched mm. very much. Mm. How funny. Um, earlier in the season I think it's um, a bit more palatable. Maybe that happened here, maybe this is from a while back. That's it. There. See the old, the old leaf material, they actually break off, the leaf blades break off from the sheaths. Uh, the, uh, sort of not attached to the rest of the plant, which is why you can pick them up and toss them about. Uh, the wind will pick them up sometimes, and maybe that's why one of its names is Flying Bent, that sometimes the wind will pick up litter and blow it around in the wind.